Yeah, so just to continue on from what Verity has been talking about, I'm going to bring it down to some sort of practical phylogenetics and describe how we've been using genomic surveillance and phylogenetics in the current SARS-CoV-2 pandemic. And as Verity's mentioned, we've, you know, we've had so much time and effort being invested into getting up and running sequencing SARS-CoV-2 around the UK, around the world, um, that it's really important for there to be a really straightforward way to get immediate use of that data. As Verity mentioned, as of this morning, uh, 362,000 submissions of SARS-CoV-2 genomes to GISAID, which is just absolutely phenomenal. But the first question you need to ask is how you actually get useful information out of this many sequences. And the first thing to do really is to define different clusters or groupings, and then you can actually begin comparing these different groups. And different types of questions will need different levels of grouping. So for instance, here you, so previously we were seeing some kind of larger groupings and um, you can answer questions sort of broad scale, maybe trends over time, overviews of the tree. Um, and then smaller groupings will be able to answer different questions. So I thought um, to maybe clarify some things like nomenclature um, surrounding SARS-CoV-2 at the moment, we have these different terms that get batted around strains, clades, lineages, variants, and I thought I'd just touch on what each of these things mean and what we what we mean when we refer to them. Um, so just to <laughs> clarify, there is only one strain of SARS-CoV-2 as of yet. <laughs> um, different strains of viruses have different biological properties. And to demonstrate what we're talking about in terms of why there's only one strain in this pandemic, I'm going to zoom out a bit and sort of and give an overview. So we're looking at beta coronaviruses. So this is the genus level of, um, of, of the current pandemic. And we see the sort of known beta coronaviruses here. We've got MERS, we've got SARS-CoV-1, and in red, you can see SARS-CoV-2 highlighted. And if we zoom into just the SARS and SARS-like coronavirus sequences, Again, we can see that there's still a really significant amount of diversity here. We see long branches between uh, SARS-CoV and SARS-like viruses. And in red, we can see our current pandemic. So um, some of the bat and pangolin virus sequences that are sort of closely related are, are near it, but you can still see we can't actually resolve anything there in that image. So if we zoom in again, just to the current SARS-CoV-2 pandemic, and its closest known um, bat sequence, actually, I think we might have a closer one now, but um, one of the closest known bat sequences, you can still see this really striking long branch representing about 1200 mutations. So it's actually only by zooming into just the SARS-CoV-2 pandemic sequences, which is when we'll finally be able to resolve diversity within the pandemic um, by eye. Um, so this is a sort of schema of um, of the whole pandemic that we've been uh, seeing. Um, this figure uh, we, I created with Emma Hodcroft um, a few months ago. And there've been over 300,000 sequences generated, but most of them are within a relatively small number of mutations from one another. So there is this really limited diversity that we see. So grouping the phylogeny is a challenge, but it's really crucial to do this. It's sort of question number one, um, in order to answer questions about the genomics that was, that's been done. So for SARS-CoV-2, there's currently two different resolutions of groupings that we're using. So there's clades and lineages. Clades, um, including um, neck strain clades and GISAID clades, um, split the current tree. Um, we've got more now, actually, but they split the current tree into um, here you see five. We've got more clades now. But it's um, sort of large scale diversity patterns that are based on SNPs across the phylogeny. Um, there's criteria like minimum size and minimum persistence before a clade is designated um, and sort of suitable for things like long term tracking over years, looking at trends. And you will be very familiar probably with the next strain um, year letter naming system. Um, the other sort of end of the scale is the lineage system that's been in use for SARS-CoV-2. So, it's a different resolution and it's a finer scale and tries to capture the edge of the pandemic, the sort of 
front edge and it's sort of more suited to outbreak investigations because it's tracking on a finer scale. But because it's fine scale and as Verity was discussing, um, this the tree space is sort of uncertain, it does mean that the lineages are less stable. So lineages may come and go with different data releases and as more data is produced. So one notable difference between clades and lineages, um, other than their size and their persistence, is that the lineage system is actually hierarchical. So there's this inbuilt structure into the naming scheme and it uses epidemiological information in addition to the genetic data. So it goes beyond just labeling the tree. Um, examples of um, epi information that we might use are say uh, geography and we could define a lineage as a potential new cluster that's begun in a geographically distinct place. So we require a SNP to define them because otherwise you can't tell them apart from the rest of the tree. But then we look for evidence of onward transmission and that sort of translates to diversity within that, within that uh, cluster. So an example here, you see a sort of classic lineage where in the background we had UK diversity and here you see an introduction, um, we don't infer direction, but here you see um, a sort of Indian uh, lineage um, in a distinct location. There's diversity within that part of the tree and um, you can see there's a support on, on the branches. And one notable thing really about a lineage system like this is that the size of the lineage doesn't matter. So you can have really big lineages and we do, we have B.1, which is an enormous lineage that's spread around the world. And you can have really small lineages as well with only a handful of sequences. Um, to sort of dig into the hierarchy of the scheme um, a little bit more, um, here you just see a schema of the SARS-CoV-2 tree structure. So A, um, you see here, began in Wuhan, um, part of B was also in China, and then B.1 corresponds roughly to the Northern Italian outbreak early last year. And much of the last year, the sequencing efforts have shown that the diversity around the globe has been dominated by B.1 and B.1.1 and their sublineages. And as the pandemic progresses, we get increased depth. So we go to B.1.1.1 and B.1.1.2 and this could become infinitely long. So we do have B.1.1.1.1 and two, um, but we don't want these names to continue because it's difficult to say and difficult to tell apart. So at a certain point, we create an alias when the name reaches a certain depth. So um, B.1.1.1.1 becomes C.1 and then sister lineages become C.2 and so on. And we actually have, so C.1 and C.2 are South African lineages. And um, you might be aware of the recent lineage of concern um, in Nuno Faria's recent vir virological post, which was B.1.1.28.1, which we're actually referring to as P.1. So we filled in C, D, E, F all the way along, and we've now reached lineage P. So we've talked about lineages. Um, early last year, um, I've been working on a tool to assign them. And by assigning lineages, we have this simple, powerful piece of information that can help inform infection control in hospitals and care homes, and also even inform governments. So um, it's a simple tool. Originally, it used a maximum likelihood assignment. And um, we had this big global tree that was ma manually curated lineages in um, and selected down a representative guide tree. And then with JT, uh, we worked on placing sequences um, that were queries and input into Pangolin into the most likely place for them to live in the tree. Um, and as more and more sequences were produced and more and more lineages were defined, we had to adopt a new approach because the maximum likelihood placement became far too slow. So with Pangolearn, we can uh, train a model and take into account all of the diversity in the tree. So we have this new uh, machine learning approach 
um, and that's what determines the assignments now. And we've gone through various iterations of models at this stage um, and have at the moment the, the most uh, recent one is a decision tree model. So Emily's currently working on a hierarchical logistic regression that we think is going to increase assignment accuracy as well. And one of the most um, amazing developments this year was the Pangolin web app that Anthony and the team at the CGPS developed. Um, it's made it really, really straightforward for people to get lineages assigned to their sequences. And to date, um, Pangolin has assigned 478,609 unique SARS-CoV-2 sequences, which is amazing. So we know about lineages, um, but what if we want to investigate at a finer scale, even to the lineage level? Um, we, for instance, when we want to distinguish between two different viruses within a lineage. And that's where variants come in. So we use variants or mutations. So, and this is how we distinguish one virus from another. And if there are very many variants or SNPs that differ between two samples, that gives us usable information. One particular variant um, that seemed to have biological function last year that um, people have been talking about is the D614G mutation um, that you can see here. It's um, present in one of the sp in the spike protein, and it causes a conformational change. And it's predicted in the lab to allow the virus to enter human cells more readily. So you're probably well aware of it. Um, and indeed, we have seen a global takeover of the D614G mutation, which we've been calling Doug and the ancestral form we've been calling Douglas. Um, so we have seen this and we look at the tree of the epidemic, we actually see the mutations occurred multiple times. Um, so we call that a homoplasy. And there's also been another mutation, uh, D614N or DAN, that occurred at the same time and spread. So if we look at the origin, it actually occurred when the virus was still in China um, and the large northern Italian outbreak this year that really spawned off the European epidemic has the Doug mutation. So the good news, though, is that although it's maybe more transmissible, it's not linked to disease severity and it's also or it's already here. You know, it's the virus we know. So. Pangolin was a tool that came out early last year. I think I created the repo at the start of April. And as the cases began to rise in Edinburgh, there were sort of questions about outbreaks um, in the hospital um, that Rebecca Dewar, our clinical scientist, wanted to use genomics to answer. So early on in the, in the pandemic, I was manually getting these relevant sequences out, building trees out of them from the hospital sequences running pangolin on them and writing reports um, on specific outbreaks. And trying to convey information in the reports um, that Verity actually discussed earlier about how on a polytomy of identical sequences, it doesn't actually infer transmission. But I was doing this while also trying to juggle quite a lot of things and the reports were certainly not being made in real time, which is not ideal, particularly as so much effort was being put into sequencing these samples. And similarly, earlier this year, I did some analysis with our collaborator Placide, um, and I summarized what lineages were circulating in the DRC at the time, built a tree, wrote a report, put it on virological. But really, it's not actually trivial to do an analysis like this. It involved quite a lot of steps, like downloading from GISAID, putting in QC filters, down sampling, deduplicating, masking out sites and alignment, making a tree, um, doing a bunch of things to try and estimate bounds on the numbers of introductions to the DRC. So it's a doable analysis, but it was delayed and it, you know, Placide had to wait for me to do it. So ideally, the situation would be for the analysis to be done locally and in real time. And with sequences from SARS-CoV-2, so many countries around the world, I made this map just before Christmas. So if it's, it might be a little bit different today. Um, so many countries have shared genomes on GISAID. And depending on the question you'll an you're asking, you want different pieces of information. So, you know, what goes into a phylogeny report varies depending on whether you want to 
track chains of transmission or do an outbreak investigation. So we wanted to make it as um, easy as possible for people to do this. Um, so to try and help with that, um, to provide a resource of phylogenetic best practices, Ben Jackson has been constructing a global phylogeny every day on CLIMB. And COG, as you might have heard already, is uh, set up as decentralized. So you have decentralized sequencing and bioinformatics, and then all the data gets uploaded to CLIMB and processed there through Majora. Um, and Grapevine gets run and we analyze it up in Edinburgh. And then we disseminate the information back out. And this gets run every single day. So the thing is, you now have all that information and this global tree available. Um, and depending on your question, you can kind of pull out the relevant kinds of information. And to make this as straightforward as possible, um, for researchers, clinicians to do this, we've developed CIVIT, um, or Cluster Investigation and Virus Epidemiology Tool. So Verity and I have been working on that now for nearly a year. And it's quite a flexible tool, um, which can pull out rele relevant bits of the tree and can kind of let you tease apart relationships between a set of sequences and generates a report um, with a range of different figure options that each kind of provide different uh, levels of information that might inform an outbreak. And re researchers and clinicians around the UK have actually been running CIVIT um, to do things like out outbreak investigations, to rule out cases of transmission and to inform contact tracing efforts. And because people are running it themselves, it means that they can actually inf access that information as soon as the consensus sequence is generated. So the way it works is we take the big tree that Ben generates and say you have a sequence of interest, it identifies the local context of the tree. And you can configure that size. You, if you've got brand new sequences that have just come straight off the um, machine and have been processed by say the Arctic pipeline or something, um, Civic quickly identifies the closest sequence in the global tree and it can then pull out that context as well. So with SARS-CoV-2, um, when we pull these trees out, they're still pretty big at this stage because we have these huge polytomies as well. So we actually summarise even further um, and we display only information relevant to the investigation. So we see here tree sequences of interest. Uh, CIVIT will highlight the relationships between them and provide summary information about the collapsed nodes. You can also customize what sequences get collapsed or not and the extent of the collapsing. For instance, you can protect certain sequences, like all of the sequences from a certain area or a certain country. Um, if you're sort of interested um, in seeing sequences from a period of time, for instance. And when you collapse down these summary trees, we, act, we can then add, at that point add in your new sequences. And then it's quite quick to actually uh, rerun these and rebuild the local trees. And it produces a report um, of these local trees, displaying the collapsed phylogenies and then colouring the sequences of interest. It summarises the variants, as we sort of were talking about earlier, that are in each of your samples. And sort of on a broader scale, you can actually even define your report by just certain factors in the metadata. So you could um, run civet with the, this particular command here, country equals DRC, and it would pull out all the sequences um, in the tree that are from the DRC, um, meaning the same analysis that I told you about earlier that I ran for Placide could actually be reproduced very quickly with a single command so long as this large background tree is available. So this can be done with Civet, um, which is sort of intrinsically linked to CLIMB right now, um, or with LAMA, which is a generalization of Civet that is geared uh, towards surveillance as well, and sort of summarizing lineage content. So we've seen that you can zoom in and use the tree to investigate clusters of interest say in a hospital or even on a national level, um, and investigate things like variants. Um, but more recently, um, we've been moving sort of slightly away from single uh, variant tracking 
and towards looking at constellations. And constellations are combinations of variants. Um, and as you're likely aware, there's been a couple of recent um, lineages of interest um, that we've been tracking, and they have constellations of mutations um, that may have biological significance. So for instance, we've been tracking lineages uh, B117 and B.1.351 or 501YV2, which have combinations of a number of biologically significant mutations. And as of yesterday, we're also now tracking P.1 um, to help us uh, track um, P.1 being the, the lineage I referred to earlier from uh, Nina Faria's virological post. So to help us do that, we've developed a tool um, that's been running every day um, called Grinch. Uh, we use the latest data on GISAID every day and use Pangolin to assign them. And Grinch pulls out the lineages of concern and produces some count statistics and a number of figures. And then we host the results and the report that it produces um, on covlineages.org. Um, just to give you a background of, say, B.1.1 or B.1.1.7, um, as of yesterday, uh, there's now 13,699 sequences on GISAID. We've seen it in 35 different countries. Over the last few weeks, we've been looking at the spread of this, um, of this variant of the lineage. So 35 different countries represented by sequences on GISAID. There's 51 different countries um, with reports of B117 sequences. So we're tracking the media reports as well because we realize that there can be a lag in getting the sequences up onto GISAID. We also have information about counts of passengers leaving London airports in October. Um, to give um, a sort of idea of actual movement of people um, because this sort of hopefully will account a little bit for differences in genomic surveillance efforts in different countries because as we know different countries um, are sequencing more intensely than others the UK for instance is sequencing very intensely um, I'm just going to check where I am for time I might you're, you're absolutely fine just take uh, as long as you need okay no problem um, yeah, the next section of um, I'll just introduce Polcat, which is another um, another tool. So Polcat is um, phylogenetic overview and local epidemiological cluster analysis tool. So it's another tool that can help us look at these constellations, look at us, um, look at um, sort of clusters of interest um, within this global phylogeny. So when we talked about civet, you can sort of zoom right in to the phylogeny in, into the local local section that you're interested in um, and use that to investigate um, sort of outbreaks and on a on a sort of smaller scale and um, say in a hospital or something like that. Um, another tool sort of approaches and uses the tree in a different angle. It sort of traverses across the tree and calculates a set of summary statistics about every single node and its descendants. And it's to try and identify clusters of interest. So every node in the tree is the base of a potential cluster. And then we rank these nodes by various statistics. For instance, recency, which describes how many days ago that most recent tip was. Growth rate, which is the number of um, tips over the day range. And things like how old the cluster is, so we can find recent ones um, and new ones and stuff like that. So how widely distributed it is. Um, and comparing these multiple statistics, um, we're able to uh, compare, we can, we can compare one or two or, or rank um, based on various statistics. So for instance, along stem length, which um, B117 has, um, is, is uh, sort of indicative of a number of mutations occurring along that, along that branch. And if um, it's sort of a widely distributed cluster as well, we might want to flag it. Um, it could flag things. So when you see this long stem length, 
uh, for a cluster within the UK, because we've got quite an intense um, genomic surveillance system in place, um, it can often indicate imports from abroad, um, from maybe a place that isn't sequencing quite so intensely. Um, so for example, here we're looking at this stem length across the nodes in the tree. Um, and if we want to uh, cluster, sorry, yeah, for these clusters, you can rank them by growth rate. So if we, if we look at the stem length here and then actually rank them by another statistic, you can pull out and flag the fastest growing clusters that are actually in your tree. Um, and then Polcat also generates a report um, which is interactive. So it can summarize the clusters that fit the criteria you specify and has some filterable metadata tables as well. Um, it also shows uh, the tree of that cluster and can give you uh, information about that particular tree. Um, this is using FigTree.js that JT McCrowan helped develop. And you can collapse away things that you're not interested in and then actually print the report as you see it on screen. So there's um, a huge number of statistics that you can use in Polcat to rank by, to optimize by, to try and find clusters of interest. So in summary, we have this sort of suite of tools now that allows us to enforce the phylogenetic best practices by supplying the global tree. And then um, all of these tools allow us to query the tree and actually get useful information out of it. We supply it every 24 hours, um, being hosted on the COG website. Um, yeah, so I just wanted to finish off by thanking everybody in the lab, people in COG, um, CLIMB, and the Arctic Network as well. So. First question from um, Benjamin. Is phylogenetic analysis particularly useful for smaller outbreaks with fully sampled transmission chains? For example, using historical data at the beginning of the pandemic, or would you just expect a tree with one uh, giant uh, polytomy? So um, I actually should have said this a bit. I kind of uh, got a bit stuck on all of the negative bits about genomic epidemiology and forgot to say the, the main good bit about it, which is that um, it's really good for ruling out transmission. So um, in an environment where you have a transmission chain, you're interested in you sequence everything, um, you might end up with a big polytomy, but you might end up with a surprising few sequences that are completely disconnected and they turn out not to be um, part of that transmission chain at all. So that's kind of maybe more where the genomic epidemiology could help you out there. Um, if they turn out to be all part of the same transmission chain, you might end up with a large polytomy. Um, I think for COVID, I don't, I don't know of very many instances where there's like fully sampled transmission chains. They do it quite a lot with um, tuberculosis, I think, where they will do like, a, they will just go and sample everyone and then they do this really detailed genomic epidemiology on it. Um, I suspect with SARS-CoV-2, you might end up with quite a large polytomy if all of those people are genuinely in one transmission chain. Um, but the joy is that you might find out that some of them aren't. Brilliant, okay, thank you. And the kind of related question to that, from Evelyn is um, how do you or do you subsample or downsample sequences that, which are not diverse at all? So if you have lots of identical sequences, for example. Do you, so in the in the big global tree at the moment, we to construct it and to sort of save time and calculating it, um, we do collapse down identical sequences. But many phylogenetic uh, uh, softwares actually do that already. So when you run IQ tree it collapses out identical sequences and then puts them back in at the end as well. So, so we do that and we're sort of working towards um, collapsing out um, sort of downsampling based on admin um, on, on country level, for instance, we can do that as well. So um, I know that Ben is uh, downsampling outside of the UK and when he's uh, calculating the big cog tree. Um, but I think it's important to put those sequences back in as well to give you a full picture of the sort of virus that's circulating. Yeah, and it's, it's, sorry, it's, no, really, it's really amazing to be in a, in a position where we're talking about dance, downsampling genetic data, like until this epidemic, every time we've sequenced anything, it's been like 
just get as much data as possible, get as much out there. So the fact that we're even discussing how we downsample is and subsample these data sets is just testament to like how amazing the genomic sequencing global response has been. Just to feel positive. That, that. that triggered a question for me, which I'm worried about is um, obviously we've got, I think we're talking about a couple of hundred thousand UK sequences and at least another couple of hundred thousand international sequences. Um, is this is this going to scale in terms of building a tree of everything through maximum likelihood methods that you that you talked about? Um, it, it, does this continually scale, or um, are, are kind of some other approaches going to be required uh, to deal with that number? Yeah, I think I think we're sort of reaching the point now where uh, we're tools just aren't going to be able to cope. So so they've done well and we've been sort of keeping up with it so far with by developing new tools. You know, for instance, um, Grapevine version one um, was um, mostly written in Python and um, we've now been, um, well, Andrew, uh, Andrew Rambo has been uh, slowly converting most of the steps into Java um, so that it's faster and sort of still producing results within the time frame. Um, but at a certain point, we will have to start considering alternatives to that. And it perhaps, so at the sort of earlier on um, last year, we were constructing a, th a tree once a week. And then we moved to every two days and then we moved to every 24 hours. And maybe we'll have to move back towards doing it once a, once a week again at some point. Um, there's, we've also been talking about um, sort of moving towards constructing subtrees sort of on the fly a little bit, you know, um, and, and separating the, the tree out and um, updating certain parts of the tree and sort of maybe adding sequences iteratively as well. There are tools that can do this like Usher and stuff we've been looking at. So um, there's there's definitely options still that we're going to continue to to work on. So, but yeah, you're right. It, it You know, if we have a million sequences, that's not going to be sustainable. No. And then... Um... Sorry. Go on. <laughs> and uh, in some so like some advances have been made as well already so like um when we're trying to do beast analyses of these trees so do a, a bayesian tree building approach um previously uh it would take a very long time to do that because it's bayesian and it's this whole thing that these takes a long time to run um jt has spent quite a lot of the last year um developing a new way of um, calculating tree likelihoods, which means that we can now run beast analyses on tens of thousands of sequences um, in like a day or two when previously, um, when I was running stuff in my first year on Ebola, so 1500 sequences, it would take like a week to do a similar kind of analysis. So like some of the like big strides um, are being made, although we still have to cut up the tree, but at least, you know, we've gone from a thousand sequences to tens of thousands of sequences. So the, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a very interesting problem uh, to have. It does seem likely we're going to get to a million sequences, unfortunately. Yeah. Um, so more work to be done. Um, Evelyn's asked in the chat, just if you could reiterate, I think she's asking what um, what homoplasies are. So, uh, yeah, I can answer that. So um, when I pointed out the D614G tree, for instance, um, we see that the same mutation has come up a number of times in the tree. More recently, people have been talking about the N501Y mutation. So when we look across this um, big global tree, we actually see this mutation occurring in multiple places independently. And that's what a homoplasy is. That's what we refer to. So it can actually be um, a sort of complication in estimating these trees as well, because that data obviously um, you would use and you might think that it should link sequences together. But um, as we see in virus evolution, mutations can come up um, quite often. They come up um, independently. Um, and again, we're sort of seeing this. So yeah, homoplasies are when we see these, these mutations occurring multiple times in the tree. Yeah. Thank you. Um, here's a question. Uh, Majda says it's a naive question. I think it's a good question. What, why are the SARS-CoV-2 variants named after countries when the original origin was from Wuhan? Is this due to people's movement? So I think this is uh, maybe an issue in the media at the moment. We don't name variants after countries. I think 
um, you know, particularly with lineage um, designations and clade designations by Nextrain, there's actually an effort to move away from any sort of um, association with a particular country. Because p particularly when we're talking about the sequencing intensities of different of different countries, we can only guess where these variants originated. Um, they might necessarily be where this first sequence was detected. Um, so, so I think actually we shouldn't name variants after countries, and and we currently don't, and unfortunately we can't control what gets picked up in the media a hundred percent. And if we could, I think we would definitely uh, recommend not to be naming them after countries. Yeah, you're right. It's a, it's a really good point, though. It's a good point, and and I think retrospectively, viruses named after places like Ebola, um, uh, named after the river, uh, Zika, named after the forest. Um, um, I think that's a matter of regret that, that, that they are named that way. And, um, and and certainly the WHO are quite clear that pathogens shouldn't be named after the place of origin. Yeah. And um, I think actually that is even when you're, when we're talking about variants, I think naming um, a very, you know, a, a particular lineage of concern, a variant name is, is it's been a topic of, um, of a lot of debate recently um, because we also don't necessarily know which variant or which mutation is the biologically relevant one. So we have been sort of flagging up N501Y, um, which is what when you know we're talking about lineage, um, say B1351 and B117, they both have this mutation. Um, but we don't actually know, and maybe evidence will come out that it's this um, 484K mutation that's actually the the one causing any sort of biological effect. So, so that's another thing to be wary of is actually um, naming, a, you know, a lineage of concern about against a certain um, variant name as well. So that's why we're trying to move towards this constellation system, um, which hopefully will sort of stop any um, any particular variant or any particular country being associated with lineages of concern. Brilliant. Okay, there's two kind of quite quick to answer questions. Um, Nabil is wondering what happens um, thinking about the pangolin lineage naming system and thinking about the recently named P1. What happens when we run out of the alphabet? So what happens after Z? He's worried about that. I think we'll go in the way of batteries and go double A, um, triple A. That's the, <laughs> yeah. Um, I think that's the current system. Yeah. Makes sense. And uh, Tiago is, um, and this is a very important question for the next part, actually, for the homework. Um, is Civit available only for the UK consortium? And if I use Llama, should I generate my own global tree? Barry, do you want to answer that or will I? I don't mind. It's... Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, so at the moment, Civit is um, just for the UK, but we are working on making it uh, more flexible for the future. Um, we're about to get uh, a new server and we're hoping to build a user interface um, like the Pangolin user interface so that people can use Civit and some of the like background data will be hosted. Um, for Civit or for Llama you would need to provide a background tree though so you would need a background tree and um, a background alignment as well containing the data. For the homework we've provided that um, and really it's just uh, using Civit in that, it's just so that you can get the report really and explore a bit um, the kind of information that we use. Um, yeah. It is possible to, so we, we're hosting that tree. Um, so on the COG website, we're hosting the global tree. You would need to get the sequences um, through GISAID um, is the only thing, because we can't provide the, other than COG sequences, we can't provide the sequences obviously. Um, but um, Rob Lanfear is also hosting a tree and I think with an associated alignment as well. So I think that there are ways of getting around this. Um, and like Verity was saying, yeah, um, hopefully in the near future, we'll, we'll be able to actually provide, provide that behind some, behind a server. So 